coming out. Uh, my name is Jessica Knapp, and I am the Online Engagement Coordinator for Canada's History Society, and I will also be your host for tonight. Tonight, Ryan McManaman and Dave Alexander will be speaking about the Owen Sound Collegiate and Vocational Institute's War and Memory Legacy Project. But first, I will say a bit about Canada's History Society. Canada's History Society is a national charitable organization dedicated to making Canadian history popular for a general audience. We do this in a number of ways, including our flagship publications, Canada's History Magazine, formerly known as The Beaver, and Kayak, Canada's History Magazine for Kids. Canada's History is also responsible for selecting finalists for the Governor General's History Awards. Ryan and Dave received the 2014 Governor General's History Award for Excellence in Teaching, as well as the 2014 Government of Canada History Award. The GG's History War for Excellence in Teaching was created in 1996 to recognize exceptional history edu educators and to encourage greater collaboration and exchange of ideas within Canada's teaching community. Since 1996, Canada's history has celebrated hundreds of recipients and finalists while creating a national network of enthusiastic and innovative history teachers. The Government of Canada History Award is presented to both teachers and students. The Teaching Award asks teachers to submit high school level lesson plans and projects based on one of three themes, including Symbols of Canada, World War II, and Canadian Prime Ministers. The Student Essay Comp Contest, which is the component of the Government of Canada History Award for students, asks grade 10 and 11 students to tackle one of five challenging questions about Canadian history. The deadline for both of these, for both uh, components of the Government of Canada Award is April 17th, 2015. So if you're a teacher, encourage this competition to your students. Uh, the essay is, is relatively short and definitely manageable in the time remaining. So if you're interested in knowing more about these awards or anything else about Canada's history, you're welcome to email me or you can look, click on the link on the screen, historyawards.ca, and bookmark it and take a look at it later. A few reminders for tonight. Uh, if you have any glitches or lagging, uh, there will be a recording available later this week, but an attempt to eliminate any of those technical difficulties, I recommend closing down uh, any programs that you're not currently using. We are also on social media, so if you'd like to spread the word about the conversation, you're welcome to. We are on Twitter and Facebook, and you can use those links on the screen as well. As many of you are familiar, familiar with, I will be sending out a survey uh, to get your feedback about tonight's webinar, as well as any other webinars you may watch on our website. The survey is available for all of them. So I will be sure to put that in the link in the put that link in the conversation towards the end of tonight's webinar. And that is my short introduction tonight. I will load Ryan and Dave's PowerPoint while they take this opportunity to uh, introduce themselves. Again, uh, we, we thank everyone for uh, uh, showing up for this webinar, and uh, we must mention technology is, is fairly new for us, too, so uh, be patient with us as uh, we go through things tonight. And Jessica, do I have control? So again, the, the theme, historic uh, venues, and of course, uh, um, we're going to feature, to begin with in a few minutes, just a little bit more detail about the Owen Sound Collegiate and Vocational Institute, and then of course, how it connected to our uh, War and Memory uh, project. Um, just to give a, a brief overview of what we're going to do, and I'll just take you through this, but uh, first of all, we will look at our model of inquiry. Um, we'll get into some of the curriculum connections. 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, we need to detail the historic venue itself, so the school. And then um, we want to talk about gathering primary source evidence and then engaging our students in original research and the learning of history. Uh, we want to focus on some of the, the projects of uh, war and memory that our students have been involved in. Some of them are quite unique. Um, then we want to uh, broaden our horizon. There, there are other historic venues, multiple historic venues that we should look at, uh, uh, not just focused here on Owen Sound. Um, and then we, we do uh, want to sum up just a little bit about uh, researching and documenting your own historic venue. And then, of course, uh, along with that, we'll just uh, show some of the sources at the end. So uh, just to, to go through the, uh, the model, it's, it's a, a model of, of historic inquiry. And um, just the, the first component of that model was, was gathering the primary source evidence. And uh, there will be more details on some of these phases as we go through the, the webinar tonight. Um, but the, the OSCVI Digital Soldier Library is a, is a growing repository of primary source evidence that has been developed and utilized by our students in their research and learning of history. Uh, number two, student engagement in historical investigation. Students complete individual research using the latest technologies and an evidence-based approach, being able to contextualize the service and sacrifice of soldiers, sailors, airwomen, and airmen with the uh, broader framework of Canadian and world history in the background. And then three, a, a vital component of this model of inquiry is historical thinking. So apply the historical thinking concepts to learning and research. Our students use primary source evidence to identify continuity and change, analyze cause and consequence, take historical perspectives, establish historical significance, and understand the ethical dimensions of history. And then finally, um, the last phase or component of the, the model is reflection and meaningful uh, commemoration. Uh, the students discover where and how they fit within this history, and then by extension, these discoveries lead to further reflection and meaningful commemoration within their school, community, country, and in fact, actually in some international venues too. I'll pass it over to Ryan. Thanks, Dave. So one of the things we wanted to do was uh, establish the curriculum connections to our project. Um, we feel that the project really uh, could fit with many different history courses, but in the Ontario curriculum, um, the Canadian history since World War I is where we uh, have originally used uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, project. Uh, the specific um, strands that we feel are link well to this project include the historical inquiry and skill development, uh, Canada in 1914 to 1929, and Canada 1929 to 1945. Uh, we, as I said, feel that uh, expectations and spe specific expectations um, are met with uh, this uh, project. And uh, I think you'll see more examples of this as we work our way through the presentation uh, in terms of learning activities and assignments uh, and some of the evaluation that we've done. One of the things that uh, Dave kind of already mentioned, but the historical thinking concepts, um, we're certainly not here to focus on them, but they have become a, a very important part of our project. Um, as you can see there, historical thinking concepts uh, establish historic significance, use primary source evidence, identify continuity and change, analyze cause and consequence, take historical perspectives, and understand the ethical dimension of historical interpretations. Um, it's something that we try to introduce early on in our courses, and we've strived to uh, incorporate these into our learning activities, assignments, and evaluation, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, Peter Satius at UBC was kind enough to uh, grant us permission to use some of these images tonight in this presentation, and he did want us to encourage uh, anyone uh, watching or viewing this presentation to access copies, and you can see the link um, given there on that specific page. Uh, and that's where uh, you can find out more information. But clearly something that we're uh, trying to focus more and more on in our projects. I 
think we're going back to. So let's take you to the historic venue itself, uh, the Owen Sound Collegiate Vocational Institute. Uh, the, the school's history actually harkens back to the days of, of Edgerton uh, Ryerson. Again, we're not here to uh, give a detailed uh, history lesson right now, but it was first established in 1856, and of course the institution now is uh, approaching its 159th birthday. Uh, one of the earlier buildings you can see actually in uh, this image, and of course I, I will bring the pointer down here, but I think we're pretty clear on that. Um, and so the, in the more modern version, uh, you can see it's to the right hand of your slide. Uh, and and uh, obviously we've gone through, uh, we've morphed through uh, several versions of, of the actual physical plant, but uh, uh, more recently the, the modern version opened in uh, 1999. But certainly um, one of the things as we'll talk about as we move through this, there, there's been an effort to uh, uh, you know, maintain some of the integrity of the school's history. And so if we uh, go to this next slide, so they, uh, one of the catastrophes that the, the school ended up facing here in, in uh, 1952, uh, there was a major fire. Uh, we have a copy of the Owen Sound Sun-Times from, from that time period. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, it disrupted the school at the time, but I guess one of the things that we look at looking back from, from where we are now is that uh, unfortunately some of the important records of students including those who, who served uh, you know in the armed forces during the first world war uh, were destroyed so we, we would have loved to have some of that information but uh, unfortunately that, that's just what happened uh, and then a feature of that school at the time just it's you know post second world war was the original book of remembrance in a memorial cabinet in a memorial hall had been built uh, to the, the students who served uh, during the Second World War. And I'll get into more of that detail just, just momentarily. And so unfortunately, that legacy was lost too. Um, you may realize this, maybe not, but uh, we do have some famous alumni from the school. I'll, I'll start with Ag Agnes Campbell McPhail, uh, the first woman elected to the House of Commons. Uh, her riding was uh, Southeast Gray County in uh, 1921. She, she attended the school in the early 1900s. Uh, almost with this other gentleman who I'll get to just in a second, but uh, she was also, should be mentioned, one of the first uh, two women to be elected to the Ontario Legislature in 1943, so uh, certainly a pioneer in women's history. Uh, Dr. Norman Bethune, who uh, some of us may be interested or know something about, uh, um, he's just in the middle here, uh, surgeon, inventor, political activist, certainly a controversial man at times, uh, depending on whose history you're looking at. But he invented the mobile blood transfusion unit during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, he provided medical aid uh, to the Chinese in the late 1930s, uh, you know, with, with both the Second World War fighting the Japanese and, of course, with uh, communist forces, but uh, the, the Civil War that had been fought. Unfortunately, though, he died of septicemia. Um, and, the, and the nice thing that for, this, for the modern day version of the school and any visitor or the students see this every day, there's, there's two temple fan, foundation plaques. We didn't include images here. You'll see uh, a, an example maybe later. They were erected at the OSCBI to acknowledge Dr. Bethune and Agnes McPhail. And then of course, uh, William Avery, Billy Bishop, uh, credited with 72 victories as a fighter pilot during the Great War. And then um, he was, of course, awarded the Victoria Cross for his lone early dawn raid in June of 1917. And then uh, another great accomplishment that maybe we overlook in history is the fact that Air Marshal Bishop played a very important role in uh, recruitment during the Second World War. Um, again, helping uh, and pinning, I, I believe, the, uh, the wings on many pilots and, and navigators, etc., uh, during that time period. One of the great things if you enter the school through the main entrance way is you come into what, what's been renamed in honor of, of the old version uh, Memorial Hall once again. And one of the things that you'll note, and this did come from the original school, uh, it's the Boer War plaque. And so two teachers and one former student did make the supreme sacrifice and uh, they were noted there. I apologize for the flash in the middle of the picture. but. Um, one of the things, and I don't know if you can see this, and if I uh, can drop my arrow here again, here we are. Um, if you notice, once again, 
our students are taken by this too because we do bring them down for in-school uh, tours and uh, is the maple leaf and no doubt about it this plaque was uh, early 1900s so it was interesting to note that and then of course they always note I don't know how well it shows up in the image that you're seeing on your computer screens right now but uh, uh, the rifles with uh, bayonets on them and then of course uh, the different uh, flags of the the time period so um, we, we do come down and have our students analyze that and then of course uh, we, we take them again in Memorial Hall to the Great War plaque and again uh, in total we have them look at these numbers that 407 students served during the Great War uh, 56 of them actually made the supreme sacrifice and one of the things we like to note and it is in this corner of the plaque you it won't be very clear to you whoops I'll bring my arrow back here right down here we always have them look over in this section of the plaque too because there's uh, 18 women who served as, as nursing, sirs, uh, nursing sisters. And uh, what we have done in, in the school, we have accessed five of their service files. So some of our students in the past have taken an interest in nursing sisters and the role that they played during the Great War. And again, we look forward the changes that are happening and the availability of service files which Ryan will talk about later we look forward to someday having one of our students look into all 18 nurses and uh, the the role that they played uh, during the, the uh, First World War and then as we move down a little bit further in Memorial Hall um, you can see once again we have the uh, memorial cabinet is to the right of the image that you're looking there and over 1100 students uh, served former students served during the second world war and then right above you'll notice there's a plaque there you won't see it in a lot of clarity but 59 of them made the supreme sacrifice um, an effort was made the the book of remembrance you can see there it, it uh, looks fairly clear in the the image that uh, it was actually burned the original during the fire of 1952 so it was replaced with the marble uh, structure and uh, of course with the fallen just above and again a, a lot of credit goes to the OSCVI Alumni Association because what they they ensured that these legacies were passed on to the new structures so uh, that you know these these came from the older schools and it's it's nice to have them in the new building and our students do uh, take note of them a more recent addition that our students have been involved in is our memorial cabinet they, they resurrected the one that I mentioned that had burned down earlier in 1952 and uh, it, it highlights commemorative efforts that our students have made, current students, and also it's, it's a tribute to uh, the crew members, the fallen crew members of Lancaster RF-150. More of that will come up later on. And again, we were very fortunately, uh, fortunate recently, uh, we had uh, uh, a major uh, event at the school, almost, we're almost on the anniversary of that event, more to come up that just in a, a few minutes, but a image uh, of a Halifax bomber from 424 Squadron was presented to the school roughly a year ago by the Bomber Command Museum of uh, Nanton, Alberta. So again, it's it's uh, with pride we, we put that up. Uh, one of the other things I should mention is another former student, uh, his name is uh, Donald McKenzie. Uh, he served as colonel for the 48th Highlanders. And so there's a, a special tribute to him uh, that's been again sort of passed down through the generations so again uh, it, it's turned out to be a very special location in the school so at this time I'm gonna hand you back over to Ryan thanks Dave um, one of the things that we heard earlier in the historical thinking concepts is the uh, emphasis of uh, primary source evidence and as teachers, sometimes that can be difficult to find or difficult to interpret. Um, one of the things that we've we've tried to do with with these projects is uh, to to promote evidence-based history. Uh, Professor Emeritus Terry Kopp of the Laurier Center for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies advocates evidence-based history, and we have striven to uh, incorporate this philosophy in our constructivist approach to learning. One of the ways that we've tried to gather that primary source evidence, and as Dave already mentioned, we're fortunate to have an active alumni association, and, and we have the OSCVI Heritage Room. 
Uh, within the OSCVI Heritage Room, there are uh, many of the old yearbooks or the what's called the auditorium. Uh, you can see to the left there a number of issues of the auditorium. Uh, these go back uh, uh, the last hundred years. And uh, the early editions really focus more on the literary efforts of students um, at the OSCVI. Um, but as we move into the 1930s, uh, more personal anecdotes from former students uh, ha have been entered into the auditorium. What we use with the auditorium, oftentimes our students will access this information and uh, look at when they're researching their, their service uh, men, women, they'll be able to um, find out perhaps more about them by looking for entries within the auditorium. Uh, and it does provide some interesting insights into their, the, their early lives. And uh, you see to the right there an anniversary edition, the 125th anniversary edition of, um, of the auditorium and uh, some of the um, past editions have been put into that anniversary edition. So again, another uh, tool that we've used uh, in having students use these primary sources. Um, we've also been lucky to, to make connections within our community. Um, you see uh, there, and I'll just get the pointer, um, you see a couple of the newspapers. Um, and again, 1945 and a 1946 edition. Uh, these were donated to the school and something that we've tried to uh, scan and, and have the students use. Um, these are the Owen Sound Sun Times. And we've also... Uh, used uh, microfiche from the Owen Sound Library and uh, I think they have microfiche dating back to the uh, mid 19th century uh, in the library so we've used uh, microfiche to try and find out again providing more primary sources for students to use in their research. Uh, you also see on the page an image of Donald Moore again another uh, another soldier that you'll hear about later in our presentation and the last image you see is, uh, is the, the letter, uh, and I'm just getting used to this pointer. Uh, this letter is uh, from Company Sergeant Major Earl Weaver of the Perth Regiment, a Second World War soldier that unfortunately was killed. But a number of these letters we've been able to uh, add to uh, our digital library, as you'll hear, you'll hear more about later, and having students access this information when they're doing their research. Another valuable uh, source of information has been Library and Archives Canada. Um, you see in front of you there some of the different um, parts of a service file. Uh, the attestation papers, casualty act of service papers, uh, medals that were awarded to the particular soldier, uh, even correspondence sent and received from the Department of National Defense, all included in service files. Um, we found, and you can kind of see it there, that uh, the, the digital nature of, of our project, some of these are, are viewed best in uh, Adobe PDF files when we can kind of see some color. It just brings that uh, level of realism, I guess, to these documents, and it's uh, a little more user-friendly, we found. Um, and again, for those interested in trying to do more research when it comes to uh, First and Second World War soldiers, uh, it has been, uh, it's great news that of the 620,000 uh, CEF uh, files for soldiers, nursing sisters and chaplains, uh, they're currently being digitized by Library and Archives Canada. And it's expected that that will be completed by the spring of 2017. So again, a, a good resource that, that can be accessed and uh, provides just great primary source information. Other sources that we've used in, in researching uh, have been war diaries. You see an image of a war diary um, at the bottom. This is of the uh, 4th CMR, uh, April uh, 1917. And so you can see how, um, how much of this has, uh, can also aid in uh, doing research. Uh, you can see both the CEF war diaries and the Second World War diaries uh, are online 
and these can be accessed again through Library and Archives Canada and some of the Second World War diaries can be accessed uh, through the Laurier Military History Archive especially for uh, research involving D-Day and the Battle of Normandy. Um, we also see um, official histories like the Nicholson, uh, Colonel Nicholson book that you see up in our right hand corner. Um, again a great resource to, to, for students to use. Uh, it's online and accessible in a digitized format and has been uh, a great assistance for our projects. Um, we also have some official histories that can be accessed again through the Department of National Defense Directorate of History. That's the online source. Another useful potential uh, useful source would be uh, regimental associations and their museums. Um, we've been lucky enough, for instance, with the Regina Rifles Association, Cam Kevin Lambie has been a great assistance with some research and we've had uh, other opportunities to touch base with other regimental associations and they've been very helpful. I've already kind of talked about this, but to kind of see it, uh, to, to understand a little more, we have what's called the OSCVI Digital Soldier Library. Within that, we've we've kind of coined the phrase soldier packs, which we have for Canadian ex Expeditionary Forces soldiers and nursing sisters. We also have soldier packs for Second World War servicemen. Uh, within our digital library, we also have letter collections for both, both First and Second World War servicemen. We have uh, the OSCVI Remembers in Image Inventory, which is a collection of, of images, uh, pictures that we've been able to find uh, connected to our school of, of soldiers who were killed in the First and Second World War. We have source soldier resor uh, research resources, archive student work, and uh, we've been able to share some of this with our community partners, such as Bishop House Museum Archives and National Historic Site. What we're seeing here is just to kind of give you an example, a screenshot of our digital soldier library, and you can kind of see some of the files within it. Uh, everything from our Afghanistan Day of Honor to uh, interviews that we've conducted to uh, soldiers in both the First and Second World War connected to our school and even within our community. Here you see specifically we've gone into the CEF OSCI uh, students, so First World War. Um, and you can kind of see the many of the 56 listed there. The one we want to call your attention to is uh, James Thompson Robb. As we open his specific file, you start to see some of what's in a soldier pack. Everything from their service file from Library and Archives Canada to um, images, if we've been able to find them, of that particular soldier to um, as well a newspaper clippings, that microfiche I mentioned earlier, that could be uh, stored in his specific file. And I just want to call your attention to the info pack, which is an interpretive pack um, that we've been lucky enough to uh, use courtesy of uh, Blake Seward and his Lest We Forget project, which has been uh, a tremendous influence on us and on our various projects. Blake's been a, a great asset and a great help and this info package is uh, uh, what's something that Blake developed to, uh, to assist users in interpreting the files. And it, again, it's been very useful for us uh, and we've included in each one of our soldier packs. And the last thing we wanted to pull out and, and show was, was a soldier mystery. This is an, uh, one of the, a couple of pages of a booklet that students work their way through. Um, we're trying to emphasize primary source evidence, as you can see there, and it's uh, and link it directly to the historical thinking concepts. And one of the unique features within these soldier mysteries is that the soldier is kind of talking to the student. As the student works their way through their soldier pack, it's the soldier kind of asking them the information. And we've found that that's uh, been useful to uh, get the student to identify a little more and, and just a little more co connection with their particular soldier. And it, it is, it's almost like uh, the soldier is speaking to the student. 
and I think I'm going to be here for this next part. Thanks, Ryan. Um, again, what, what we'd like to talk about now is, is how we engage or engaging students in original research and, and learning history. Um, just before we start, I think we'll give the, the first words to this section to Dr. Peter Satius, again, of the University of uh, British Columbia Center for the Study of Historical Consciousness. Uh, this, this quotation came from uh, a text, New Possibilities for the Past. Um, though fa factual knowledge is a building block for a student's understanding of the past, the, memori the memorization of a catalog of facts is clearly inadequate by any standards as a meaningful goal uh, uh, for history education. So, you know, the old let's just memorize facts and dates and events, that, that's not the way to do history anymore. And I think many teachers now are realizing that paradigm shift where they're they're getting students more actively involved. And of course, as we mentioned already, the historical thinking concepts goes a long way to, to do that. So one of the things through the years with our students, and we just wanted to show some of the things that they do, they, they've been interviewers. And, and of course, we're into oral history. I was just uh, noting in the most recent edition of Canada's History how there's a, a column talking about the importance of storytelling and, and oral history. And there's been a, a rich past where we've been able to do it. We Just in this upper uh, left-hand corner here, here, um, if I can get my arrow working. Uh, sorry, there we are. Uh, just in that upper left hand corner, um, we have uh, Bill Granger. Unfortunately, uh, Bill has, has since passed away, but he's, he's with two students um, of the time period, Rob and Andy, and, and they were able to, to interview. Uh, Mr. Granger, and then ultimately uh, from that oral interview, they created a, uh, a story which was published in the Owen Sound Sun Times. We must admit, over the years, the Owen Sound Sun Times has been fabulous for uh, publishing student work. And then as we uh, work our way down, two more students um, interviewed Maddie, and, and uh, in this case, um, Karen, they had a chance to, to interview veteran June Belanger, and, and June had a, a fabulous story about uh, when she came back from overseas, uh, literally trying to chase her husband from Quebec City to Owen Sound to catch up with them. Um, they, they all, as we know with, with veterans, they all have fabulous stories, and, and uh, again, it's great that they can pass this information on to, to younger Canadians. And then if we go up here, um, we have another veteran, Bill Corbett, uh, a very vigorous man. Uh, to this day, Bill still is in his early 90s, uh, playing golf not too long ago. But uh, again, he's with Jay and, and Matt in this picture. He actually is holding on to a, a picture of his sextant, which uh, he was in a artillery division that, or artillery regiment, I should say, that uh, that started during the Battle of Normandy and actually moved right into to Holland. And again, he told some some interesting anecdotes. And and uh, these two gentlemen out of that story ended up. Uh, uh, publishing uh, uh, their work in the again once again in the Sun Times, and then down here we have Nick with uh, Mr. Gilbank. Uh, a very tragic story here uh, about, uh, and I should just move the the arrow here from Mr. Gilbank's head. But uh, hit, Mr. Gilbank's uncle actually was was killed uh, as a prisoner of war um, during the Battle of Normandy, and, and Nick had done some research here, and actually the, at this time the, the family wasn't aware of these details, and, and Nick actually in this, this image is revealing, uh, revealing some of the details uh, to Mr. Gilbank and the family about this stuff. So uh, sometimes the, you know, the student research takes, uh, you know, uh, goes in directions that you're just not sure where it'll turn up. Um, Again, the, the other thing that our students, we saw the uh, Digital Soldier Library, Ryan went through that just a few moments ago, but here we have Melanie sitting at a table and Laura's just a little bit further down and uh, Melanie is, is doing a very good job. She's got her gloves on and Melanie's going to speak to us very shortly here, but uh, they're going through and digitizing um, letters, uh, diaries, postcards, uh, and all uh, different kinds of primary source documents that came in from the public. We made an appeal. Uh, you can see the poster to the left. Uh, we, we did it through social media. Uh, also, we did it through uh, the Owen Sound Sun Times. And it's amazing the things that, that people uh, brought into us. And again, Melanie will be able to speak to uh, you know, some of the, uh, the efforts that were made by our students. Uh, researchers. 
uh, no doubt about it. We, we try to get our students, we, we've morphed, as time went on, we, we morphed away from oral history where we were doing research on the service women and the service men themselves. And it, you know, if we look up into this, this one image, we, we have uh, Brooke and Henry. Uh, they did a lot of research on the RF-150. It's, it's a Lancaster that came to a tragic end just near the end of the Second World War. More details to come on that. And then we see two other images of our students that, that were working on the, the Juno Beach project. Um, and they're, they're doing their research, they're using service files, and of course in a digital format. We realize that they're writing on paper here, but still again, as, as Ryan mentioned, it, it's great to see it on the screen because they can enlarge and it can, they, they can uh, look at that cursive writing. And uh, many of our students, as we found out today, just aren't that familiar with uh, cursive writing, but they're doing a better job. And one of the things that, that we gather a lot of gratification out is, and we've been very fortunate to uh, take our students on war and memory tours overseas, and we like the fact that they're able to give thanks to surviving uh, veterans. For example, Brooks doing that the top left-hand corner here. Uh, and then one of the other things as you peruse the other pictures, um, our students actually go to the site of soldiers that they have uh, studied, that they've researched, and they will read a tribute. Uh, you can see for uh, Lieutenant Rob, James T. Rob, the tribute was actually posted right by his headstone in a place called Ikuv. Uh, Lieutenant Rob actually was killed on the first day of Battle of uh, Vimy Ridge, and he was a former student of the OSCBI. Uh, you can see in the lower left-hand corner, um, we have Sebastian and Michael. Uh, we've gone to a place called Le Manil Patri, which is uh, just in the Normandy region. And uh, a soldier from our school, Wilford Slumsky, Corporal Wilf Wilford Slumsky, who was serving with the uh, First Hazars, was killed as, as the regiment, along with uh, many members of the Queen's Own Rifles, made an advance. So we are very fortunate to go uh, right to the location last year, and uh, Michael and Sebastian were able to uh, pay tribute to these men. Um, again, we, we included this other image of one of our students, and it's at Benny Surmer Canadian War Cemetery, and, and I think it kind of captures the impact. I, I hope that people listening have had a chance to, uh, you know, go to a, a Canadian War Cemetery or to a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery or a cemetery of, of the other combatants, of uh, French cemeteries, German cemeteries. We need to see them all, and there's there's quite an impact that they'll have on anyone, and, and this, this picture kind of captures the solitude and uh, just the, the, the thinking that, that must be going on in her head, and, and uh, so we thought we'd share that with you too. Uh, you know, speaking of, of historical thinking and uh, this whole process of, of learning, um, so as, as we've mentioned already, so the historical thinking concepts are incorporated into our soldier mysteries for, for both the First and Second World Wars. Uh, we pursue a, a constructivist approach um, where students use primary source evidence to piece together the details of a life once lived. Uh, reference, of course, is made to the service files where they can mine information about their service women and service men. Uh, sometimes other primary sources are unearthed, such as letters or diaries. Now, when we've been researching uh, uh, soldiers and, and uh, service women from our own community, we, we've had much better um, you know, success with that. Whereas if, if we're uh, researching soldiers that were killed on, and servicemen who were killed on D-Day or, uh, you know, say during uh, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, it's a little bit more difficult to access those primary sources. But what they can do is they can contextualize the, the service and sacrifice of these individuals within the larger currents of history. They, they can access, as Ryan pointed out a few minutes ago, the war diaries. The, the picture starts to broaden and they can bring in other secondary sources such as the official histories, memoirs, military histories. So that's you know where these secondary sources can be helpful. And you know what, that this is not an exact science. Uh, you know, this can be a very, you know, a real challenge, especially for uh, concrete sequential learners, but, but for anyone doing this research, for all learners. And you know, many times there's no straightforward answers, and uh, so it can be frustrating because uh, you know, many of our students today, you know, they, they want the answers right away. They want them at their fingertips, and usually they are there with their phones and, and uh, technologies that they use. Um, so a lot of times they'll, they'll do this research and they'll be left with many unanswered questions, but, but questions they need to write down and consider. 
And uh, this type of cognitive dis dissonance, that uh, this, this frustration, we, we honestly would argue, and I think most teachers would do, that actually does lead to better uh, learning outcomes. Uh, so critical historical thinking is essential because the students required to take these random historical puzzle pieces and then put them together and then they have to fashion some kind of narrative. And then of course, uh, you know, traditionally we do follow for our biographies, uh, Chicago style footnotes and bibliographies. But what we like about it, and, and we've been able to see this, is we like the fact that our students can take ownership of this process and then by extension, of course, this, this history. It's, it's a student-driven process. They're doing original research, and they really feel that they are contributing uh, something to history. Um, so just to, to take you through, uh, we, we just wanted to share some of the thoughts of our students about this type of research. And, and I think we should read it to you as we go through, and, and please read with us as we do it. So um, I mean, if they were from anywhere else, it would have been like reading it from a textbook. But I think this project has been so important because we get our local history. They were involved in our school, and so was Minnie Wright. Uh, that's from Casey. Now, Laura, she added this. She said, even though looking at the way they wrote and the different words and sayings they used, it really puts you into their time period, thinking of continuity and change here, uh, emotions in the letters. It makes them real people. It was like a close-knit community. And of course, she's talking about Owen Sound at the time. And she's talking about a, a collection of letter, letters, the many right letters. We're going to hear a little bit more about that in the past, which uh, a senior history class here, the, the, the school was able to go through. Um, speaking of uh, the RF-150, Henry, we just saw an image of Henry just a few minutes ago. He added, a, added this about his experience uh, researching this, this uh, Lancaster bomber that, that crashed in April of 1945. He said, it puts a human face on the tragedy. It was grounding to see that they attended the same high school as you. And then we thought that we'd give you a different perspective on this uh, from the Armstrong family, uh, Brian Armstrong, who uh, the whole family has been very supportive of our, our research efforts of our students through this, this uh this, this journey, I guess you could say, because it does go back about four or five years ago. So Brian said this about an event that occurred here roughly a year ago. He said, today was a culmination of a true Canadianism and a love of country by younger Canadians who gave us this day by researching something that happened 69 years ago. The uh, next one is, uh, again, uh, Molly reflecting on some student re uh, some soldier research that she did regarding uh, rifleman Donald Bernard, who was killed on D-Day. And her research was contributed to the Less We Forget Juno Beach project. Uh, to many, he is just a name of a casualty, not a young man who would never return home to his family. But although he did not want to make it through his first battle, and did not serve as a great a purpose to the war itself. His death was not meaningless. He mattered to his family, his brother who saw him lying on the ground and his family back in Canada who received the dreaded letter. He mattered to the man the single bullet could have hit instead of him and to his family. Yes, he was just one casualty, one of tens of millions who died, but to think one life is in insignificant is to think that all are. Um, one of the things, we'll, we'll mention the Juno Beach project just in a few minutes, but uh, the students wrote tributes, and this was a tribute that Katie wrote to her soldier. Uh, of course, his name you can see at the top here was James George Broadfoot. I don't believe you struggled much with your decision to enlist for the war at the young age of 19. As you, as you were said to be very keen on becoming a paratrooper, and were a military-minded youth, as cited by Captain H.J. Newman, an Army examiner. Your story and sacrifices have touched my heart and changed my perspective on the world. I promise you, your fight and the meaning of your death will never be forgotten. And again, we will go through that uh, project in a little bit more detail in a few minutes, just so you get a better understanding. Uh, 
Again, we're going to hear from Melanie in uh, just a few minutes, but uh, after completing some research on the life of Private Arthur Mackey, this is uh, her quote. When discussing war, it's easy to get swallowed up in the numbers. By highlighting the efforts of one individual, the service and sacrifice Canadians made during times of war becomes more relatable. We only forget the individuals involved if we let ourselves. Again, we're uh, maybe just to, to give the last words for this section, we'll go to uh, Dr. Ellen Sears from the, the Faculty of Education at the Uni uh, University of New Brunswick, and I believe he is re uh, also connected to the Gregg Center. Uh, scholars and teachers who advocate developing students' capacities for historical thinking are committed to engaging students as active agents in understanding not only the historical materials, but also the processes and deliberations that uh, shape those materials. So I'll pass it back to Ryan. So one of the uh, things we've talked a lot about is um, through some of our research and our community connections, we have um, done a lot of, a lot of um, interesting and, and some large projects. Two of the larger ones uh, were the what we called the mini write letters. These were uh, approximately 55 letters um, from eight different soldiers of the Great War who were uh, writing home to a Miss Minnie Wright. Uh, these letters were found in her son, Mac McCarroll's, uh, or her, her son found them in, uh, in an attic in the 1960s, and they were kind of discarded. But he, was, um, he allowed us to, uh, to have access to them, and we were able to scan them and then introduce them to a grade 12 class. Um, you can see some examples. Obviously, this is a postcard example to the top left. We see uh, Mac reading some of these letters at his home in 2012. And uh, the letters, again, are, are in response to many sending care packages uh, to the soldiers overseas. So from the student's point of view, these were quite interesting because they give us a glimpse of um, of what the soldiers were facing on the front lines and also uh, just some connections to what one person back on the home front back here in Owen Sound uh, was doing to try and help and do her bit. Um, again, that's Mac reading them there. We see uh, soldiers, uh, soldier students in the classroom doing some research with the letters. By this point, the, the letters had been scanned. And what they were trying to do was, again, take the scanned letter and, um, and try and transcribe it. Uh, and again, some of that cursive writing and trying to figure out uh, certain expressions that uh, were used almost 100 years ago and what that actually meant. There was just a fascinating look into, into these letters for the students. One of the neat things that we were able to do was uh, take those letters and uh, put together a dramatic interpretation that we performed at the uh, 2013 uh, OSCVI Remembrance Day Assembly, uh, and it kind of gave a voice to not only many, but also their letter writers, and kind of had a bit of a, a correspondence back and forth where we were able to to tell the story and um, and perform that in front of the school, which was quite a, a special moment for everyone involved. Another project that we've been involved in, and in a a, a large project was uh, what started as sol sol soldier research. You see in the top left corner there, uh, these are two former students to the OSCVI, uh, Kerwood Armstrong and Carmen Watson. They're two names that appeared consecutively on the casualty list of uh, the OSCVI al alumni killed during the Second World War. They were killed on April 5th, 1945, and they were both part of the RCAF. What student research uncovered was that they were both on the same crew, a Lancaster, uh, that had went down in a village lane end in England on a return of a bombing run over uh, Luna, Germany. Uh, this research kind of, and as Dave said earlier, you never know where some of this research will go. Uh, it certainly started to expand, and uh, one of the things that happened was uh, the current day, uh, they, they were flying the 424 squadron uh, during the Second World War and the current day 424 squadron um, out of Trenton, uh, the transport and rescue squadron, Canadian Forces based Trenton, 
uh, contacted the school and, and arranged to do a flyover as a tribute. And you saw part of that memorial cabinet earlier in our presentation, which uh, was linked to these two particular former students. They wanted to do a flyover as a tribute as well. And one of the neat things we were able to do was have the school go out to our parking lot and make a 424 formation. Uh, and this, you know, we, we had students involved, uh, not only from our history students, but math students to kind of come up with a concept of how we would actually make that 424 and, and uh, how many students in a row and that sort of thing. And it, it was just a very special moment, I think, for the entire school and got the entire school body involved. At the same time as the flyover at the school, there was a, a memorial service held at our cenotaph in Owen Sound. Here you see members of um, Kerwood Armstrong's family, his brothers and sisters, uh, along with a Legion representative laying a memorial wreath. And then again, uh, quite a shot taken from our Owen Sound Sun Times um, of, of the flyover over the cenotaph. But as you can see in these pictures, um, this took, uh, in, this was, became an entire school event and really a community event. And you see at the cenotaph, there are members of our community uh, out. And it would be tough not to have heard uh, the uh, C-130 Hercules as it was flying over. Um, and, and it became another one of those special projects, again, stemming back from originally student research or uh, community connections. And I'm going to turn it over to Dave for the next. So we, we mentioned the, the Lest We Forget Juno Beach uh, project already, and, and a lot of credit uh, should go to two gentlemen um, who are going to make a, a presentation in April, on April 22nd, 7th, uh, 7 p.m., and that's uh, Mason Black and Blake Seward. They're, they're going to talk about a new project, the, the Road to, to Vimy. It's a Lest We Forget project. And uh, Blake had invited us to become involved in this project, a, a very unique uh, collaboration, as you can see, as you maybe go through this information here, that it was an idea to, to research the 371 Canadian servicemen who were killed on D-Day. So not, not just the, the soldiers that landed on Juno Beach, but uh, the airmen, and then, of course, as we mentioned just a few minutes ago, the paratroopers. And uh, uh, some of these gentlemen had actually been, unfortunately, uh, looked that, that that we haven't heard about them for almost 70 years, and then it took the efforts of, of students to, you know, uncover their stories, their their uh, their narratives, and uh, the unique thing about this project. And again, uh, we we're not taking credit here. The credit goes to uh, to Blake uh, Seward, especially uh, in this case that uh, we had three Ontario secondary schools. We had Smith Falls District Collegiate Institute, Garth Webb Secondary School. And of course, the Owen Sound Collegiate and Vocational Institute get involved in the research uh, effort. And then uh, one of the things that uh, Mason Black uh, led with his students back at uh, uh, Smith Falls, once again, was developing a supporting phone app um, that portrayed all this information. It's, it's a great app, and, and uh, maybe perhaps they might talk a little bit about more uh, on how that process worked in the future. And then uh, another aspect of the project uh, was at the Juno Beach Center itself at Corsoul Samaire in France. Uh, they had tribute markers that they erected for uh, um, those 371 individuals. And a, a unique feature of the, the tribute markers was a QR code that was on the back. And if somebody, uh, a user, a phone user, cell phone user, was uh, swiped the QR code, then the student research would actually come up. And, uh, uh, from what we hear from the officials at the Juno Beach uh, Center, uh, the, this uh, memorial became quite popular with uh, the local French citizens too, not to mention you know, Canadian visitors and, and uh, all the other nationalities that, that showed up at the time. One of the things that uh, Dave and I wanted to do was not just have the, the teacher perspective here in a, uh, some of these projects we've done, but to hear from a student. And um, we were lucky enough that Melanie Pledger, a student at OSCVI, uh, who has been involved in a number of these projects, um, was kind enough to, to uh, come and tonight and uh, share some of her thoughts on these projects and on, uh, on what we've done here at the school. So again, welcome, Melanie. Um, I'm just going to ask a few questions to Melanie. Uh, first question is, uh, Melanie, what projects have you been you completed or participated in 
at the OSCVI? Well, over the past four years, I've researched three local servicemen in total, the first of which was Donald Moore. You saw his picture up here not too long ago. That was when I was in grade 10, so 2011, 2012. And that was in my history class. We had to hand in a final assignment, either just a regular essay and a PowerPoint to go with it, or a sort of biography and a PowerPoint on a soldier. I believe I was the only one in the class to choose the soldier. I'm not sure why. It seemed like the more interesting of the two choices available. But I used his soldier pack, as you again saw earlier, um, as well as online and local resources to find out as much as I could about him. So that was my first exposure to primary documents. The second soldier I researched was Neil Edward MacDonald, or Ed, as I call him. That was basically um, the same sort of deal as with Donald. I was in grade 12 at that point, and this came in through the many right letters, actually. My class was transcribing them. And so for my final project, in addition to having Ed's soldier file, I also incorporated his letters that he wrote home to many. Most recently, I've created a small exhibit at Bishop House, the Billy Bishop Museum, on Arthur Mackey. You can see him on screen now. Um, yes, and if anybody's in the area and is listening and you'd like to see the exhibit, it's there until the end of April. <laughs> so feel free to see that. Uh, that was through my cooperative education placement last semester. And at the end of grade 12, I offered to transcribe Arthur's over 100 letters in my free time. I was sort of into this kind of thing by that point. <laughs> Um, and that was gotten through Digital Preservation Day, as we talked about. My teacher gave me those. Brian McManaman here. <laughs> um, I ended up holding on to the letters until school started again last September in the fall to use at my co-op for the exhibit. I knew in advance I would be creating an, ex an exhibit at Bishop House. In addition to the letters and local resources, the Mackey family was kind enough to loan me photographs as well as additional artifacts of arts that I could use in the exhibit. And finally, I participated in this past year's Digital Preservation Day. I helped scan. Thanks, Melanie. Melanie. Um, how did the use of primary sources impact your research? Using primary documents offers a unique, albeit limited, perspective of things. So I was only seeing things as my subject was, the person I was researching. So it was necessary to branch out to additional sources if I wanted all the information in the bigger picture. The great thing about using letters, though, is that I wasn't just learning about the individual's biographical details, but I was also getting a sense of their character. So I ended up really feeling as though I knew Ed, and especially Art, as he wrote to home quite a bit. <laughs> Great. Um, what challenges did you encounter with this research? Again, sometimes when we see the final project of something, it looks like it's all being put together and it's it's a neat package and it's been done. But there must have been some challenges along the way. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is how difficult it can be to read cursive. I think that was mentioned already. Um, uh, yeah, just okay. <laughs> I got better at it though the more letters that I read. There's also a bit of a learning curve when it comes to the language used. Again, that um, was also brought up. I'm not ashamed to say I had to take to the internet more than on more than one occasion to figure out what exactly was being said there. Sometimes it was difficult to pick up on sarcasm as well because obviously I didn't have any social cues to pick up on. And censorship could be a bit of an inconvenience as well, where sections of the letters were physically removed or even blacked out. And typically because of the sheer amount of information I had, it was impossible to include everything in my final projects, which was a shame. And another unique problem, whoops, sorry, I had was identifying Arthur for my exhibit. I had all these photos that the family had given me, but I wasn't entirely sure which one was Arthur. So I had this picture here on screen that you can see. This, that is actually Arthur. I'll, I will tell you in advance, but I didn't know that at the time. On the back of the photograph, there was written two names, Arthur and Ben Lee. So I knew he was in it, but I didn't know which one he was until I came across one of Arthur's letters later on. Um, you can see the quote here. You will have to excuse the scribble as my thumb is all tied up. I cut it slightly on a can of sardines I was opening for supper last night. Ben Lee and I got our pictures taken today, and I will send you one. So if you notice, Arthur, I knew this was Arthur because if you look close enough, you can see his right thumb has been bandaged, so 
that was a very unique problem to me, but very rewarding when I figured out who Arthur was in that photograph. Again, very observant. Again, many people would have, uh, I'm sure, uh, missed that, but very observant. Finally, uh, Melanie, from a student's perspective, why is it important to study the lives of individual servicemen and women, in your opinion? Well, in my experience, it's a lot more interesting to be studying history through the eyes of someone who has lived it, as opposed to words written in a textbook. Um, I think I was quoted earlier on this, but it's very easy to get lost in the numbers and statistics of war, but by making it personal, we can get real meaning from the numbers so we can put a face to them. Really though, it's about remembering individuals. One of my favorite quotes comes from a guy named David Eagleman. He says, there are two deaths. There are three deaths, excuse me. The first is when the body ceases to function. The second is when the body is consigned to the grave. The third is that moment sometime in the future when your name is spoken for the last time. So it's really up to us to keep speaking these guys' names. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. Um, uh, as our audience can see tonight and, and here, um, it's uh, Melanie's uh, an exemplary student, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight and sharing your thoughts. Uh, it's been very interesting as a teacher to see uh, a student like Melanie come through and, and do so much work, not only in the classroom, but beyond. And uh, the work uh, is, is just exceptional. And again, as Melanie said, if anyone in the area could come and see the exhibit, uh, it's, it's really well done and a real professional job. So, so what we see here is um, multiple historic venues and project influences. Again, just to kind of stick to, uh, to uh, what our theme is tonight. Um, you see uh, in the top left corner, you see uh, Dylan and Molly uh, accept the Lieutenant Governor's Ontario Heritage Award for Youth Achievement with our MPP in our area, Bill Walker. They were both co-recipients along with students from Smith Falls District Collegiate Institute and Garth Webb Secondary School. Um, moving across, we see Dylan um, pays his respects to David Vivian Curry, who is buried at Greenwood Cemetery in Owen Sound. Again, another uh, local venue where students um, have visited and um, and can certainly be connected to many different, within any community, um, what's... Uh, what's within our, our local area can be accessed. Uh, and moving across the page, we see uh, the Owen Sound Cenotaph, another great place to visit and perhaps find um, more information, more things to research. Again, one of the challenges with teachers is, where do I go to, to find out and even to start with these stories? Perhaps it's at your local cenotaph. Um, this particular cenotaph was designed by Amu uh, Emmanuel Hahn and uh, who had worked as an understudy of uh, Walter Alward, um, who's obviously connected to the Vimy Ridge Memorial. Um, you see, again, some of the different um, plaques and interpretive plaques. This is located at the Owen Sound Cenotaph, or just next to it, um, where we see Tommy Holmes and, and his VC. Uh, we, we see some information on, on that. Um, we also Again, we had a chance to go to Ottawa and bring tributes that students had, had written up at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier to Warrant Officer Vincent, uh, Vincent and Corporal, Corporal Cirillo at Canada's National War Memorial in Ottawa. So multiple venues can be used to, uh, to try and bring about student engagement and to find out more about your community. Very quickly here again, I apologize for that. Uh, I, here we are with the arrow in the upper left-hand corner. Um, we're with our students actually on location on the 60th, uh, 65th anniversary of uh, D-Day and uh, at Bernier, Bernier Samer. And uh, this is a, a veteran who became uh, 
associated with our school. Uh, basically, we adopted him. He, he came several times to do uh, talks at the school. And uh, his name is Orville Cook. And uh, Orville landed uh, at Bernier-Samer with the Queen's Own Rifles uh, 65 years to the day. And so what we wanted to do is, is bring a student group there and support Orville um, on this anniversary. And so after he did a, a special ceremony with the uh, Westlake Brothers Association, uh, he came over and, and uh, spoke to our students. And uh, again, these opportunities definitely are fleeting. And, and uh, we're very lucky to uh, get this opportunity to, to meet with Orville on this location. So these historic venues are important. Uh, you know, moving down just underneath, um, we have again a couple of our students. We have, we have Kevin and Matt, and they're meeting with uh, some veterans from the 48th Highlanders. Uh, this is in 2010, and it's the 65th anniversary of the liberation of the Netherlands. Uh, and it, we're very lucky, uh, Kevin, who the arrow's pointing at, and Matt, who's just over here to the left, had a chance to uh, interview. Um, Herb Pike. And uh, again, Sergeant Pike, uh, he related his uh, experiences. And, and the thing that uh, is very sacred or important, both to the 48th Highlander uh, Regiment and, of course, to our school, is Lieutenant Colonel uh, McKenzie, who we mentioned earlier, was uh, killed very close to this spot. And so uh, we met with the, uh, the Highlanders and uh, paid tribute to um, not just Lieutenant Colonel McKenzie, but also to uh, all the other members of the regiment. And uh, that's the river uh, Isil just in behind where uh, the 48th Highlanders uh, crossed that and then continued on their way to uh, Appledore. And then uh, one of the other things, of course, I, I think more people might recognize this uh, location is, is at the base of the Vimy Memorial. We have a student group there in 2012. Uh, we'd gone over for the 95th anniversary of the, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, and our students had actually researched uh, six soldiers from our school who were listed uh, on the base with uh, the over 10,000 names. And, you know, the, the irony is, and, and it was a good learning experience, that those six soldiers that were listed on the Vimy Memorial, they weren't actually killed um, fighting at Vimy. They actually were all killed uh, during the Battle of the Somme. So they, they realized the... Uh, you know, just the, the, the hazards of that war and, and, of course, they have no known grave in France. And then that, that same tour, uh, we continued on, and Ryan's already mentioned the story of the RF-150. We were able to go right to the location where uh, uh, the RF-150 came down near Lane Inn, uh, Buckhamshire. And uh, two of our students here, again, are, are laying a Canadian flag and a, a poppy. Um, right on this location where the bomber crashed. And, and again, you know, it, it sounds, uh, uh, I, well, uh, seen as believing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And it, it sounds maybe a little cliche, but uh, it, it is important to get to these sites, and it has quite an effect on you, as we mentioned earlier. Um, at this time, and I'll, I'll try to hurry up here, we've gone a little bit longer than I thought we would, but project influences. I think it's very important that uh, Ryan's been talking about community connections and you know we're very grateful first of all for the Blue Water Board of Education and our colleagues, uh, the administration in the school, our senior administration, they've been very supportive uh, of our endeavors. Uh, we mentioned the OSCVI Alumni Association, um, you know the efforts that they've made to pursue, uh, preserve the school's history and then of course the, the support that they have provided for us uh, again, please do this. Uh, we haven't talked too much about this today, but find your local uh, branch of the Royal Canadian Legion. And branches 6 and 464 have been very supportive for us for the last 10 years in, in doing these things. Uh, also, our, our local museums, first of all, Grey Roots Museum and Archives. Uh, again, I should mention some names here. So the, the interim mani uh, manager of Museum and Archives, Petal Furness, she's been very supportive. Susan Martin, Karen Noble and Joan uh, Hislop. I, I think it's important to go through these names because you see the, the community and, and the active role that they played with our school to, to do the things that we have. And then already mentioned today is, is Bishop House Museum Archives and National Historic Site. Uh, a director and chief curator, Virginia Icorn, uh, archivist, uh, Mindy Gill-Johnson, Diane Folds, Diane Sprung, Trevor Pfeiffer, and uh, Patty Gibson Sargent. All these individuals have helped our students in their research endeavors and Digital Preservation Day. The Canadian Armed Forces, uh, we saw 424 Transport and Rescue Squadron, you know, bringing a CC-130 Hercules up here. Uh, great, great and simple foresters, our local regiment, uh, especially Lieutenant Colonel Shane MacArthur. Uh, Captain Stephen Deiter, uh, he's helped us with many of our projects. 
Uh, we also need to, to thank the Historical Thinking Project, uh, Dr. Peter Satius and Jill Collier. Again, they've had influences on, on of course, our teaching and uh, the use of the historical thinking concepts. Lest we forget, we've already mentioned them, but uh, uh, Mason Black and uh, Blake Seward. Again, we're, we're very grateful to these two individuals and, and the help that they provided for the things that we've done. The Juno Beach Center, uh, veteran Garth Webb, who unfortunately is no longer uh, with us, uh, Marine Jose Lafond, and then more recently, uh, Jenna Sustag uh, Meisner. Again, they've all helped us with the, the projects that we've done here. Um, reaching out internationally, the, the Westlake Brothers Souvenir Association, we made a connection with Christophe Collette from Caen, uh, France, and the help that he's provided and his students. Uh, we actually uh, uh, participated with our students last year when we were overseas in France during the 70th anniversary of uh, D-Day with his students in uh, uh, two uh, different uh, commemorative uh, presentations. Uh, the Laurier Center for Military Strategic and Disarmament uh, Studies, uh, you know, going up to the uh, professional historian level, uh, Matt Sims, uh, he helped us out. And then again, we owe a, a lot to uh, Professor Terry Kopp and his wise uh, advice on doing this type of research. Uh, not only that, but the Gregg Center for uh, the Study of War and Society, uh, Drs. Uh, Cindy Brown, Alan Sears, and Lee Windsor, uh, again, uh, they provided many perspectives for us, which uh, we've tried to bring into the classroom. And then uh, finally, well, not finally, but uh, Canada's history, uh, Joel Ralph, Joanna Dawson, and then, of course, uh, uh, Jessica, who's with us here today. And then uh, I think our, our last thanks goes to uh, our students and, the, and our veterans and their families who participated in our projects of war and memory in the past. We're, we're very grateful for them uh, doing that for us. So again, one of the challenges I think for anyone is uh, trying to find your own historical niche um, and how you can incorporate this into the classroom. Uh, consider a theme of historical inquiry. Make community connections, as you've seen here tonight. Uh, a lot of them we've been lucky enough to make. Uh, collaborate within your community. Find community partners. Engage your students in meaningful learning where they take ownership of the history, utilizing primary source evidence. Seek out cross-boundary opportunities with professional historians. Incorporate methods of digital history. Document, remember, and commemorate, and share findings with your community. And again, uh, just uh, uh, we, we do want to show our, our sources and uh, um, just give you an opportunity if, if you need to, to look at anything in any more detail. Uh, of course, we're not going to go through those, but we do, uh, for a couple of images, again, we wanted to thank uh, Dr. Peter Satius for allowing us to use the images from the, uh, his project. Uh, Mindy Gill Johnson, she provided some, some important images, as did Bishop House. And then that amazing uh, photo of our students uh, just uh, almost a year ago in the 424 uh, formation, we do want to thank uh, Corporal Owen Budge for providing that image for us. Echo Dave's comments and, and thank you for joining us tonight. And if there are any questions, we'd be um, happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Dave. Uh, yes, at this time, this is the best time for questions. We're all still here, which is fabulous. Um, so let them come in. I am just going to formulate my thoughts and I'll have some questions for you as well. Talk a little bit about the soldier packs a little bit more and, and how, how did you come up with that name and um, all the different information that's included? Uh, sure. Um, if I, I could go back up to that particular slide, we tried to show an image earlier of what a soldier pack uh, looked like. It was kind of just an, uh, an image of, uh, or the, the, the name, I guess, yes, it's, it's kind of unique to our project. Um, 
what we tried to do was we we were aware of the the digital nature of of the world we live in today and how we can make that i guess relevant to the students or more relevant to the students and so we felt that having a, a pack of information or uh, that the students could take take with them virtually anywhere that they have access what what we encourage them to do is upload it either onto a usb or to a google drive and they can access that pack their soldier pack from anywhere um and then they're able to to kind of complete the research so it is a package of information and the one thing we like about the soldier pack is it can still be added to it's um, something that we can continue to add to as we find more information on the particular soldier uh, you can see the image there now that we've moved to it uh, there's the information or the inf uh, interpretive package that uh, was courtesy of Blake Seward but also the service file from Library and Archives Canada we try to also uh, from Library and Archives Canada have the circumstances of death which is a, a document that's recently been added to Library and Archives and it's uh, can be quite useful to understand uh, perhaps within that document talking a little bit uh, more specific about how that particular soldier died sometimes there's some information there sometimes there is not uh, we also add newspaper articles from the, the from the time period uh, that might that we may have found on that particular soldier an image is in the soldier pack if we have that and obviously so the soldier mystery the the worksheets the booklet that the students work through as they try to uh, uncover more about their soldier. Excellent, thank you. I had one follow-up question. Do you, is there a document in this soldier pack about the students that are working on the soldier that uh, to keep a record of everybody who's contributing? Yeah, as, as part of our digital soldier library, what we've tried to do is this repository of information is add a student work to that collection so that can continue to be built upon as well. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to, uh, to have some student work published in our local newspaper, but all of the student work can be saved in our digital soldier library and, and it's entitled uh, student work. And this can be uh, something that we can access at a later date um, and, and again, can be a, a place to, to store it. Excellent, thank you. So I've only just become familiar with this project uh, through your application and through that discussion and talking to you guys in preparation for this webinar. And I, there was hints to it throughout this entire webinar, but I just wanna get the facts straight. When did you guys um, start this project and, and how long has it been going on for? I, I guess the argument we, we could reach back uh, a little over 10 years ago and uh, we started talking about, uh, well as we mentioned, oral history was uh, a major feature and, and effort with our students to go out and interview local veterans and uh, basically try to tell their story and uh, and then through time the, the project morphed and uh, we realized and there's been a real um, again Blake Seward deserves a lot of credit here but there's been a real revolution in digital history and the availability of uh, primary sources and secondary sources online so Library and Archives Canada the, you know their efforts to provide the close to 620,000 uh, you know, service files for the CEF, serving CEF members, and then the number of, of digital, uh, digitized files for the Second World War dead uh, is increasing too. So it's a real avenue uh, for student research. And, you know, the, it's original and, and it allows them to access documents in, in this ownership issue, which we talked about. So, uh, you know, we focus, first of all, on our, our own area, and we continue to do that. And Melanie, you know, is a great example with her work. But again, we've been very lucky to uh, you know, participate in some of these broader projects. And again, I, I think when that next uh, webinar comes up with uh, Blake and Mason, I think it's going to be very interesting for them to share uh, more details about the Road to Vimy.
what a privilege it is to attend a school and book, and teach at a school with such a an accessible and rich history. That's incredible. Yeah, it, it, it uh, you know we're very fortunate with that. But I, again, I you know people in your community and and again uh, I think of Blake Seward's project, the Cenotaph Research, which Ryan sort of referred to a few minutes ago. Like it, it's out there in your community. That that history is close to you. So you know all you have to do and and it, you know what whatever your ethnicity is, whatever your background is, you know we're Canadians. It's it's uh, our history. It's our students' history. And uh, they should get out there and find out more about it. Uh, again, just thank you, Jessica. And um, thanks for all the people who stuck around tonight. And um, again, this is just uh, our example of, of something we've done locally. But uh, as Dave already said, I think a number of it uh, can be incorporated to, to any school and community. Again, uh, I'll, I'll, Ryan's thanked everyone. I'd, I'd like to thank Melanie once again. We, we wanted to try to bring the perspective of a student uh, in on this. And uh, again, we thank you, Jessica. We thank uh, Canada's history uh, and uh, for this opportunity.